Hi, this is Paul. Many of you who watch my channel know this other channel. It's got over 300,000 subs on YouTube, like Stories of Old. And it's sort of one of these movie preacher channels on YouTube. Why do I call them movie preacher channels? Because what preachers do is they break down uh, text and culture for the congregation and make things conscious that are actually colonizing and forming and inhabiting us at levels that are the conscious members of our consciousness, consciousness Congress aren't necessarily paying attention to. And so I did. I had a conversation with, with Matt Miller uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Matt does this kind of thing. And Like Stories of Old is one of the best channels on YouTube that does this sort of thing. I did a little bit of poking around into it, and it's a Dutchman. You can kind of tell by his accent. He's got a, he's got a very... Oh, Kind of a mesmerizing voice. It's it's a little unusual, and his accent is a is a little unusual, at least for a lot of North American ears. But a very soothing, very engaging, very haunting, and just really draws you in in terms of in terms of his voice. And what he does is he breaks down movies, and he shows the symbolism, and he 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 illuminates, and he brings to the surface the kinds of things that are are beneath the surface again usually in in major major hollywood movies now hollywood for a long time has been the one of the chief religious formations of american culture just today i saw drew dyke who is an author up in portland oregon has written some christian books he's an evangelical he's been on uh, the Phil Vischer um, uh, podcast. He's a friend with uh, with with Sky Jatani. Um, How is your church live stream going to complete compete with this? And there's this little clip of of Russell Crowe, ta not Russell Crowe, <laughs> Russell Brand, and and evangelicals. The the awareness of the church for what is happening at movies has a very interesting history. So, for example. Up until the 1960s, if you were in the Christian Reformed Church, going to movies was something that was sinful. Uh, even even my mother-in-law, who who was a fundamentalist Baptist, uh, didn't believe in going to movies because that would hurt your witness. Except that she could watch all the movies she wanted to on TV. And so you know, there's the conservative churches have a very interesting relationship with movies. Now, I went to Calvin College, and by the time I went to Calvin College, the Christian Reformed Church was all down with spiritual discernment. Um, there's perhaps something in that model that's that imagines that the conscious gatekeeper is actually able to hold the gate. But if you, you know, look at other, some of the conversation partners I've had on this channel, Matt Miller again with his um, Logos Made Flesh channel. Uh, Matt was a youth pastor. And of course, Burn Power. Burn is a, oh, Burn has just this encyclopedic knowledge of Western culture and um, has tremendous powers of deep discernment. I, I told, I mentioned Burn Power, the name to my kids the other day, and they, that's his name. I said, yeah, that's his name. That's his real name. Yeah, that's his real name. And um, and so Burn, of course, has the Anadromous channel, and and you can find you can find my conversation with him. But I just have the thumbnail to the the Joker conversation we had. So. Christian churches have have sort of been, uh, you know, playing both sides of the fence here. And if there's something true of evangelical culture, it it has often been to been to sort of make kind of a bad, competing knockoff of cultural trends, but but try to smuggle Jesus in underneath. And and sometimes they're cool. I remember Campus Life had Scream in the Dark when I was growing up, and you'd go to these Halloween haunted houses and and get terrified. And then after you went through the haunted house, you sat down for a gospel presentation. Uh, you had chalk art, and and of course the I was talking on the Discord server today. Was it on the Discord server or someplace else? Well, I was talking about the fact that you know in the in the 80s and 90s, evangelical churches 
sort of approached culture. I think we're talking some to some degree about the antithesis. You know, the 80s and 90s approached culture and said, well, the the religiosity line, which I was been talking about in my videos lately, the religiosity line scares secular people, and so we're going to strip the we're going to strip the the worship center. We're not going to call it a sanctuary or any other those, those churchy sounding words. We're going to strip the worship center of crosses or anything like that and make it look like a a junior college auditorium, and we're going to have the kind of um, pop or soft rock or smooth jazz that the people are used to listening to, and then we're just going to smuggle Jesus in under some wisdom, and that's pretty much what the seeker movement tried to do. Well, well, movies and TVs have been the primary conveyors in some ways of American religion for decades, and they both and and the propagandists for American culture all over the world, and they both express and shape the beliefs of culture in ways that often compete and outstrip traditional forums of church and sermon. There was a decade or so ago, I was doing a lot of movie-type sermons in my church where I would be taking the text and whatever issue I was dealing with in the text, and then I'd bring in a movie that I knew and have stills. And in, in many ways, a lot of that became the genesis of the PowerPoints that I use in creating my videos today to try to keep me from going ADHD all over the place. Well, like Stories of Old had its two most recent videos, at least as of uh, May 15, 2020, when I'm recording this video. Maybe the third one be, be, will be out. It's a three-part series. The, the title of the series is Stories versus Reality, and that immediately caught my attention. And I get a lot of my good uh, links from the Discord server because one of the blessings of this Discord server is because people are watching my videos, they're thinking about the same things I am, and so they're using their broader knowledge to bring in book recommendations and links, and they pour that into the Discord server, and I pull it out of the Discord server, and it just creates this, this communal conversation about a whole range of things. And you know, one of the things I really appreciate about the Discord server is, in fact, its diversity. You've got not only a diversity of Christian traditions, Orthodox, Roman Catholic, uh, fundamentalist, evangelical, people from all over the world, but but also you know atheists and and American Buddhist types and spiritual but not religious types, and so it's a it's a real hodgepodge, and so I get a nice diversity of sources through the Discord server. And that's where I, I picked this up. And once I saw the title, uh, once you see, once I see that word reality, it's like, what reality are you talking about? And the first episode was the fundamental difference in this episode. Second episode is the life, um, your life is not a hero's journey. And I thought, ooh, now we're getting countercultural. Now, the movie preacher genre is is pretty set right now on YouTube. It's a cultural liturgy, as Jamie Smith would say. Um, they use captive, you know, captured clips or stills from blockbuster movies with background narrative to reveal and illuminate what's hidden or what's really going on beneath the surface of the movie. And you know, we always sort of want the insider exclusive VIP information and they it has a lovely soundtrack. And in many ways these these movie preacher genre videos are just like the movies and and they're a deep continuation of the movie genre, but to but at sort of a deeper level. And you know, I've watched these things for years and I always enjoy them. But, but there's sort of a, a relational BSing in them of, you know, we're, we're, we're using all the tools that psychology has delivered to us to tell us how to move people emotionally. Now, is this, is this manipulation or is this just good marketing or is this just good storytelling? But, you know, we've, you know, we see the... There's, there, it's a especially these clips. There are a concentration of powerful elements Hollywood has perfected to move us emotionally, while forming us with the with the movie preacher's own narrative subtext. 
you know, the music swells, close up on the face, the dramatic moment where Frodo and Thor and Ork, you know, Oakenshield embrace. And of course, I grew up reading The Hobbit and I watched the, the Hobbit movies were not good, but still I watched them and I watched them all and I watched them all multiple times and I watched them all in the extended version because I didn't want to miss any of it and I could I could feel a little bit elitist by hating them and hating the CGI and all of that yet when I see even the movie Bilbo the young Bilbo from the Hobbit it's you know that's Bilbo. He's my friend. I've I've got to watch him. So there's the beauty and the drama and the heroics and the narrative. The hero almost always has the transfer, the transformative arc. And like I said, uh, like stories of old, this guy's one of the best on YouTube of this genre. But the irony of this little series is that he's using the perfected, insanely expensive, profitable, and effective tools to undermine the foundations of the project itself. Or is he? I think we're going to have to find that out in episode three when it comes out. But, but the irony fascinates us too, and I think it fascinates me. And, and it might leave us wondering if we're just sort of consuming empty calories, if it's if it's junk food, if it's if it's cake, but you know, it's 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 just spiking my blood sugar levels and giving me um, you know, it's not giving me any solid nutrition. So let's let's look into these and I'm not gonna play any clips from these partly because I don't know what YouTube's going to do if I do, and partly because I really don't need to, because the images are so, dare I use the word, iconic. They're so religious in our culture, just a glimpse of it instantly brings in the rest of the story, and the stories are, are especially for many on my channel, so utterly familiar. So the first video, stories versus reality. Now again, whenever you hear someone use that word real or reality, you need to pause. And this is a fudgy word for me. And it's like if someone comes into my church and I have a moment to actually allow a little bit more expanse. And if there's enough relational underfooting there and someone says spiritual, I'll pause. And I'll say, now exactly what do you mean by spiritual? And they kind of look at me like a deer in the headlights and think, well, pastors are supposed to be nice, harmless people. Don't, 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 don't throw a question back at me. But there, but someone who uses the word real or reality, you know, they're about to assert or smuggle a worldview. I mean, it's not just Jesus that gets smuggled. Everything is getting smuggled. Um, there's going to smuggle a worldview, and you're going to want to examine its credentials. And right away, the hero's journey. That's what all of the big blockbuster fandom um, movies are about. And now we're going to employ, and what's amazing about like stories of old, is that this YouTuber is an expert at all of these tools. And so while he deconstructs the monomyth, he's sort of triggering the monomyth mechanisms and machinery in our minds. You're going to employ all the tools of story and the monomyth to undermine and deconstruct the monomyth itself. Um, the videos will use the, the mostly the largest franchises and fandoms, plus a few art house clips to, to afford a degree of status and credibility in this two video set, eventually three journey we're about to go on. And of course, once we talk about the monomyth, we're right there by Joseph Campbell and a nod to every story is the same, a, a, another terrific YouTube video by Will Schroeder. And I know... Um, sometimes I think, oh, I should do, I should do videos like this and, and, and edit video and all of that. And I think, no, I don't have time for that. And I, um, if I did that, you'd probably get one crappy video out of me and you'd never hear from me again. But Joseph Campbell, the, the guy who in a sense started this in book form, 
on exposing the monomyth that that every story is the same and joseph campbell who who supposedly had you know helped guide george lucas into crafting the original star wars now if, if jordan peterson is is that uncle who's who's telling all the young men what they need men what they need to do to to grow up and become men and not just large boys then joseph campbell is grandpa and, and Carl Jung is great granddad. But now Uncle Jordan, James in our local in our local meetup would always complain, you know, Jordan's running around and he's never never giving a nod to Joseph Campbell because a lot of people rightly noted that a lot of what Jordan Peterson was doing, Joseph Campbell did a generation before. And all this mythos stuff Joseph Campbell talked about and put it in Hero Hero with a Thousand Faces. Go ahead and read the book. It's all there. And, and there have been plenty of others who have done similar things. Again, um, uh, Bly, um, you know, it comes to mind and, and, and many, many others. But, but Jordan, you know, so why, so every now and then you can, if you, you can find a clip where Jordan will men mention Joseph Campbell um, with a little bit of dismissal. Because his complaint was that, you know, this is following your bliss. And if you know anything about Jordan, life is suffering. You know, follow your bliss. Jordan, you know, Jordan's oldest child had a serious medical condition. And that kind of suffering, along with the suffering of the anxiety from the Cold War and other, probably because of where he grew up, seeing the suffering of of First Nations people in, in northern Alberta, Jordan Peterson understood suffering. And, you know, in that sense, Jordan's childhood was similar to mine in Patterson with my father's ministry. I I remember going on a college tour down to Nicaragua and one of the peep one of the one of the girls, women on the tour with us was like, We're going down to see the poor and I thought you don't need to get on an airplane to go see the poor. They're all over the place. Um, let, you know, let's go down to a different part of town. There's plenty of poor folks. And it's not romantic or, you know, they're just poor. It's just people. And it's and it's a thing. But it's not unusual. So, so Jordan was a much more dour Augustinian anthropology than, than Joseph Campbell. And um, you're not chasing your bliss. You're 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 reading Dostoevsky, and you're reading the Gulag, and you recognize that 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 suffering is a part of this world, and sometimes all you can see is suffering. And doggone it, you're not you're gonna need meaning to get through it. And so yeah, Campbell, Peterson, Jung for the masses, to one degree or another, yeah. And part of what arose the first time Joseph Campbell sort of made his round is that, well, shoot, Hero with a Thousand Faces is kind of Jesus in a Thousand Faces. Uh, look at this. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this back here. It was given to me by a, a young seminarian who did his um, who did his internship with me, and he gave this to me as a, as a, as a gift. And so here you've got Jesus, but you've got... Gandhi and a whole bunch of you know notable figures right there making up the face of Jesus. Campbell's book in some ways demonstrated why Christianity became so successful. Jesus was the archetype, the quintessential archetype of the hero. And Jordan Peterson made that 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 clear. Jesus Christ is the archetype of humanity. And and of course Peterson gets gets that from Jung. The pattern was so clear and pure in his story and anybody who's taken you know a high school english lit class looks for the christ figure and and he's all over western literature luke skywalker and tolkien kind of pours him into gandalf and aragorn and frodo um you've got prophet priest and king frodo is sort of the sacrificial priest and aragorn is the king and gandalf is the prophet uh neo in the matrix harry potter um you know Right at the end of the Marvel Universe Infinity Wars, there is Iron Man bringing the world back at the cost of his life. Tale of Two Cities, Les Miserables, 
You, you almost can't tell a story in the West without a Christ figure. It's all over the place. This, again, is is Tom Holland's point. It's It's gotten so ubiquitous we don't recognize it as distinctly religious anymore. Now we're looking for signs of religiosity. What kind of church does that person go to? And and what kinds of what kinds of politically incorrect uh, social beliefs might they have in connection with their church? The powerful leading men gave their lives sacrificially for those who had no power to save themselves from the too powerful evil that threatened their world, their hope, their happiness, and their future. Their sacrifice, the sacrifice won the day for all the rest of them. It's, it's in nearly every movie. But then there is, of course, and like stories of old, he also focuses on the tragedy. And my youngest son was watching this with me and he jumped into a, a Game of Thrones narrative and my son's like, I've got to get everyone of them spoil Games of Thrones from me because I've never seen it, he's never seen it. But in Games of Thrones, you're never quite sure about the fate of what would befall the characters. And I've read some things that have argued that game, the games of Game of Thrones was sort of a, a, a counter to Tolkien. Um... um you know, it's it's sort of the opposite of of Eric Weinstein Jesus smuggling. Um, the Greek tragedy proves the point that the worldview and the religious underpinnings of the journey is is older than Jesus. To to become a Greek god, you would do you would do wonderful, amazing things. You would do heroic things. Look at the challenges of Hercules. But then in the first video, he gives the big reveal why stories are different from reality because well here's the funny thing about stories they're always told in hindsight we don't have access to the story until we are once again looking backwards on it that's how story works and that's in contrast to reality which is just going out in front of us. And right there we're at this dogged word of ends, of purpose, of ends, of telos, of meaning. It's all a function of destination. The the kind of selectivity, selectivity that you use to construct the story in hindsight is because there's some destination that shapes the rest of the story and affords the selection so that every moment in the film arrives at the destination. It's it's Chekhov's gun. It's it's how you tell a story. It's how you become an excellent storyteller. You already know the end. Now, some of you have watched my rough draft and know that I've been playing with these ideas with First Peter. And that's why I'm actually recording this before I record my rough draft video, even though if you watch all of my videos, you will see this after my rough draft video. And you'll see some of how I've been playing with those ideas as I put together my, my Peter video. And some of you ask, well, how can you do so much? Well, it's because I'm, I'm always working on my sermons as I'm working on my other videos too. And sometimes, a lot of times, they sort of mold in together. I'm that kind of a Hollywood preacher in some ways. But the, the reason, like stories of old, says they're not real is because you can't know the end from the middle. And in order to have a story... In order to have a story, you need to know the end, which is why they're always told in reverse. Now, some of you, of course, will say, Oh, I see the move he's about to make. It's the subtraction story. That, well, Morpheus knows, or at least asserts, and believes he knows Neo's end. Before Neo gets to the end, you're the one. The Oracle has told me. Now, this is the fun stuff of movies. We love it. And when we go into the movie theater, that religiosity tripwire doesn't seem to bother us. But out here in real life, oh, I'm prophecy, I'm sorry. And so, you know, if you look at the biblical commentaries behind me, well, you know... 
We can be pretty sure of the date of this because of this, this, and this, and uh, no prophecy. There's no, there's no, there's no gap for your prophecy, sir. Remember the lines, the lines I laid out in a previous video, the lines that are clear in secularity. No agency above us, no agency apart from us, and by all means, no miracles. And we'd, we'd have to talk more about that word, but. You understand what I mean. It's close enough. Purpose was removed from the system to gain a scientific vision, and now we imagine the only knowledge we can have is scientific knowledge. Not really, of course, and we don't live like that because we live in the manifest image, but we like to pretend like we're masters of the scientific image, and it's only upon that safe room drawn from the scientific image that we actually move forward in life. So you tell the subtraction story and you can have prophecy in movies, you can have story in movies, but no one knows where they're going. Therefore, story is fantasy and it's not allowed. So another word for this, popular word right now, disenchantment. Sorry kids, stories are fun and you can feel the meaning and the journey. And so when that so when that that meaning crisis is hitting you, you know, you know, suck down some of that methadone, but stay away from the heroin, boys and girls. The heroin of imagining that this stuff really takes place. You've got story and reality, the fundamental difference. Sorry, kids, stories are fun for the feels, but please don't indulge in the primitive, low-status, indecent, immoral sin of believing in it in your real life. Gotta, gotta, well, you've just been smuggled something. It wasn't Jesus, but you've just been smuggled something. A little Darwin, a little Freud, a little this, little that. It's been smuggled into you. And for the most part, if you go back and you look at the, um, I'm not playing it here, I've played it before, it's the Veritas Forum, Dallas Willard. You only get half of the two lectures that were given there. I probably didn't have the rights to do the first one. But Dallas Willard very correctly notes that for the most part, this stuff, this worldview is passed by insinuation and promises of status heightening or lowering. Oh, you're one of those who believe in prophecy. You're one of those who believe in purpose. Well, don't you know Darwin proved there's no purpose? I'm not sure Darwin proved it. Darwin said it, and at that point in the culture, we all decided to agree. Or maybe some decided to agree. And those who decided to agree had the validation of that really cool trick of shutting one eye to the manifest image and working through science with the other. And then they said, I really only need this eye to see. I don't believe it. So when you wish upon a star was in the 50s with its patriarchy and white supremacy. You're a muggle. Know your place. And then, of course, Jordan Peterson comes along and he muddies the waters. He's almost a heretic, and he's he's right there on the line. And he gives he gives he gives Sam Harris the heebie-jeebies, and 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 Brad is you know trying to do some translation between Sam and. If you watch another video, I actually because I had a little conversation on Twitter, you've got Peugeot and you've got Peterson, and then you've got Brett and you've got Sam, and that's about where they line up. And of course, Rationality Rules is Jesus smuggling video, which I thought was a tremendous video because I thought everything he said, or almost everything he said in that video, was really right. That, that Jordan Peterson doesn't really smuggle Jesus. He doesn't really cross the line. He just makes that stairway to heaven and says, well, that's about as much as I can say in my Darwinian frame publicly, speaking as a psychologist, and shuts up there and everybody else just follows the stairs right up on over the line. Jordan Peterson comes along and goes just up to the line and won't rule out that there's a land beyond. And as Mouthy Buddha said, well, I just saw on the Uber Boyos channel, look at this. They're playing my game. They're doing interviews with some guy who went to London from Hungary, had a good high status job, you know, 
was an atheist, started listening to Jordan Peterson, flopped all the way over into the church. Now he's LARPing his way to kingdom come. So, the journey, story versus reality, the selective elements of the story are used to achieve an end. That's how stories are told. You are the central or at least an important part of the story, which has its purpose, and this affords meaning and motivation which are deeply interwoven. That's the promise of the journey. But that's story, not reality. Reality there's no purpose, destiny, plan, or telos. Your life is a series of random events. Emotions and experiences can be good or bad, so shoot for the good. Only the end... Well, you, I thought you said we couldn't know the end. Well, well, we don't know, like, if you're going to get the girl or get the job or win the war or any of those things, but there's one end we do know. And that's you're going to die. And, and so now if you just kind of, if you're an American, you push that away as far as you can. And I forget, what's his, what's his head? Had him in a video before. Suddenly death crops up and we're like, what are you doing here? You didn't expect me? Oh, you knew all along. You knew when you were a child and your guinea pig died. You knew when you were a kid and you, you brought your doggy to the vet. And you knew when you went to your grandma's funeral. And shh, we don't talk about this. The only end is your grave and then the death of all things, including memory. And so if you watch The Good Place, well, well that's what gives meaning life meaning. It's... The end still gives life meaning. It's death. But then a bunch of people begin to say, well, then what does the middle matter? And others say, no, 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 no. But that's awfully hard to expel. Stories have characters. Heroes go on journeys and achieve great things. We can't get enough of stories that work that way. We're addicts to it. Now we have a pandemic. Do your civic pride and sit at home and watch Netflix. Watch it a lot. Now suddenly the kids have an excuse pounding down Netflix story after story, show after show. There's not a lot of meaning in my regular life, so I'm on the methadone of Netflix and I just keep sucking that meaning down vicariously. They're addictive because we imaginatively cast ourselves into the story, experience the thrill of an illusory framed purpose, and vicarious, vicariously, perhaps parasitically, suck out the joyful marrow of meaning from all of these stories that wrap things up in 48 minutes or an hour or two hours, or maybe it's a whole series, so we can go longer and longer and longer. And there are heroes here. And of course, the Greeks knew all about heroes. You're a son of Zeus, after all. Now, and again, like stories of old, this guy is sharp. He's, he's top of his game. He says, uh, by the way, those heroes that have the muscles and the abs and the good looks and the strength and, and all of that, that Hollywood has conjured up that image for you, that being of light that you're taking in, it probably ain't you. You know what it takes to look like that? Hours in the gym and maybe some roids. And a lot of people, they just get it by their DNA. And, and, and the Greeks understood this. It's birthright. It's demigods. We understand genetics and birth order and inheritance and some of us are beautiful and look great in a swimsuit and others of us, eh, not so much. Some of us get it for free when we're in our 20s and, and are motivated to try and keep it all the way in through much of our lives. Others of us never had it and ain't going to get it now, baby. Heroes live uncomfortable, purpose-driven lives, sort of like Olympic athletes. But you probably don't want to eat like an Olympic athlete. They train. They're serious. Yeah, heroes? Not a lot of them. But, you know, the Hebrews played with story, too. And, and Abraham was chosen to be the father of nations. And what a strange choice. If you're going to pick a man to be the father of nations... 
don't pick a man and a woman who are already up in age and don't have any children. And Israel is chosen to be a nation of priests, a chosen possession, a, 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 a chosen people. And it says, well, I didn't choose you because you were the oldest or the biggest or the best. You are special because I chose you, Velveteen Rabbit. Genesis by Robert Alter, read by Robert Alter, comes along and says, you know, there's two unquestioning institutions in the ancient world. Primogenitor, the firstborn, gets the birthright. And polygamy, the big man gets access to all the ladies. And the book of Genesis subtly and persistently undermines the validity of those two assumptions. There is birth. But there is choice, and both are consequential. So, like stories of old, moves on from, yeah, heroes are demigods, they're born, to, well, now we're into Christian history, and the knight. The knight, well, he's noble usually, and he's wealthy, but, 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 but they're not demigods. And, and they hear the call of the divine to go out and do daring deeds. And, and they're non-consummational non, um, non love. They, 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 have, they have their love for the, the lordly woman who they would never dare to touch sexually, but they will conquer lands and do great things for, for Dulcinea. If you've never read Don Quixote, you simply must. The chivalric love is there, and 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 knights can do knights can do great deeds, and and the effort itself is ennobling, and it's noble, and and so suddenly, heroism is a little bit more democratized. Peter Thiel, in talking to Eric Metaxas, says, "You know, I remember Peter Thiel's." a little younger than I am, a couple years. He says, I remember when, when I was in college and religious groups, he grew up evangelical, there, were, there was all this talk about doing what God wants me to do and God's calling on my life. And, and, and sure, some kids were paying attention to making a lot of money after they got out of college, but others wanted to be pastors and missionaries and, and follow the will of God and, and marry who God wanted them. And, and you had job and vocation, not for money or, or glory or any of those things, but to satisfy God. That, that chivalric love didn't exactly completely pass away. And in the next stage, we have colonialism and capitalism. There are lands and markets to conquer. And, and while sure you've got the elite like Cristobal Colon or, or others like him, heroism gets increasingly democratized. You can, you can sail on a ship and you can be a role player and young men without noble birth can go out to, to make their fortune in an, in an untamed world and, and any man and every man can do it. It's the, it's the American dream. And, and again, it's been fascinating watching the, um, the, the embrace of the American dream in the IDW space, Eric and Eric Weinstein talking about it, um, and and that's interesting from someone who's who's you know who's very much on the left, depending on what on earth the left is now. You know, religion and progress. Well, as I was watching that second video, I could get a pretty clear indication of how, well, the religiosity. The Christianity in the culture, the, the suddenly reframing everything as a hero's journey, well, this is producing the capitalism and the colonialism and the progress and the ambition and all of this drive of the culture. And it's not decadent at all. The religion beneath the striving, everyone now is a hero. And, and the non-conforming individual, which is deep in American culture and deep in American movies, it's always the outsider who, who comes in. And the individual was just one who hubristically imagined that calling was possible. 
while why is it that religious scientists are the ones who are who are able to to take the status hit amongst their colleagues and take the career hit and you know again going back to the conversation between Eric and Brett where where, where Eric, big brother, is kind of being his big brother, chiding Brad on, why did you go to that small college? Because, again, Tom Holland was right. A lot of this Christian stuff went deep into the culture. And, 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 and Brett, not being a Christian, the, all the cultural values are, are tampered with it. And so Brett is going to go to that small college and, and for for little pay and little recognition, even though bigger brother Eric says, you could have won a Nobel Prize. Little brother Brett goes to the college and, and he and his wife sacrificially serve the college and the, and the values and the goals that were in that college. They, they, they pursued the dream. They were heroes. And, and, and they drew meaning from, from following the hero's journey. Well, it's real enough. To get them to sacrifice, even though, according to Eric, Brett should have gone for that Nobel Prize and stood up to the woman who robbed him of it. That's why it's religious scientists. That's why it's that's why it's true believers of various sites. Decadence and nihilism perhaps go together. Once there is no God whose approval you might be trying to win. Well, then it's just about the Benjamins. The Protestantization of heroism. This is Weber's thesis of meaning of sorts. Now that everything we do, everything we experience, and everything we feel is a venture. We're all on a hero's journey. It's an internal, psychological, personal relationship. And Luther untethers it from the church and, and the Barfieldian the Barfieldian evolution takes another interesting twist from, well, well, we're not participating in it in the sacrament. It's a it's a spiritual sacrifice and it's a real presence and it's 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 now it's it's between me and God and the church isn't there to mediate like it was before. Everyone can be a hero even if you're a working class stiff and and Bruce Springsteen and Billy Joel and John Cougar Mellencamp will sing and and the populists and this is you know some of Eric Eric Weinstein's populism. He comes by it honestly. You know, studying folk culture and the Appalachians, it's thick with it. And and how did this get in here? Jesus. Jesus got smuggled in. Jesus the hero. The hero who doesn't come in a chariot of fire down from heaven blazing like Apollo. Jesus comes and lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb. And the first 30 years of his life, he's working as a carpenter or a construction worker. He's a blue-collar guy. Boy, this, this plays, this sings. And so the, the, the hero, the lunch pail hero, goes to work in the coal mine. And I'm proud to be a coal miner's daughter. And I'm, I'm proud to be a mother. And, and Abraham Kuyper. God claims every square inch of this world and says, it is mine. And, and Martin Luther, every, every vocation stands before God. It's one speed, not two. Go back and read Andrew Root's narrative once more. It's one speed, not two. The, the construction worker and the janitor and the, and the mother and the nurse and the... And, and no matter how low, it's an honorable education. And doggone it, we love the working man in a way a Greek never could. Because if you were a Greek aristocrat, aristocrat, you did not work with your hands. You had slaves for that. But here in America, Chicago, the city of broad shoulders, we work. And work is the hero's journey. It's everywhere. It's Weber's thesis of meaning. There's also the Arminian challenge that arises. If Weber saw how Calvinism drove men to success and wealth, well, Arminius comes along and says, it's yours to lose, buddy. It's up to you. So you'd better work hard. It's up to you to grasp your purpose. Means that when we fail, 
It's your own darn fault. But, of course, at some point we realize, oh, all these representations in the movies, these are men. And they're doing manly things to, to hear the lamentation of the women. Movie representations are mostly white men, and if story creates meaning, then women are excluded. And, and where we're in this religious relationship with the movie screen... And we're no longer getting it from church and we're only getting it from the movies. Well, we'd better have theological correctness in the movies. So we have Lady Avengers. But like stories of old, notices exactly what Jonathan Peugeot notices. That, well, we still adhere to the underlying idea that it's some kind of subversion to the status quo or does portraying a woman in a traditionally male part only erase her womanhood? The American movie genre, I, I just caught a bit of, of uh, John Verveke's question and answer today, and you know he named it as well. If, if we turn all the women into, into masculine heroes, suddenly the feminine heroic is gone. You know, Elaine Pagel talking to Jordan, not Elaine Pagel, um... Paglia, mm, talking to Jordan Peterson. It was a great conversation. It, she recognizes it, the feminine heroism. Well, in the Hebrew scriptures, a woman who had many sons was a hero. Mother Russia, the woman with many sons, is a hero. Women have had their feminine ways of being heroic for, for, for millennia. Suddenly, ironically, in our attempt to theologically correct all of our movies, we've downgraded the feminine. And now, just like, ah, you can only be a man, a hero, if you've got big muscles and, and a six-pack. Well, you can only be a woman if you can bring home the bacon and fry it up in a pan and never let you forget that I'm a... It doesn't work with me. But, yeah, I mean, look at these women... They're just the counterpart of all of the men, aren't they? So we'll wait for part three. But I suspect I already know what they're going to say. Maybe I'll be wrong. I'm looking forward to it. It's a movie after all. But it's sort of Sam Harris. Well, enjoy the movie. You don't have any agency in it, but... While your life is finally futile and the only end that science, scientific knowledge affords you is the grave, have a good time before then. Don't worry about that grave. Is it really a mistake that our culture has lived in denial of death and, well, you know, questions about COVID, they're kind of triggering all of these lines, aren't they? Oh, but just enjoy the movie. Keep sucking on the methadone of Netflix. But the irony of postmodernity, a la Scott Adams, since we can't know reality, all we have is our filters and we can see what, what, what is able to at least predict, well, you, no, don't ask what you are, and don't ask where you come from, and don't ask where your desires come from. Those are spiritual questions. You can manipulate the interface to make you happy. What about meaning? We readily and nobly sacrifice happiness for meaning. But if all we can afford is really happiness, well then, I guess that's that. Can you tell I should not believe? On what basis, however, is your nihilistic frame? And that's always where I wind up when I kind of run through all of the arguments. And again, this is I've been doing this for years before I got to this video. And as I said in my previous video, why for so many years did I read C.S. Lewis's Miracles two, three times a year? Because I run through the I run through the arguments and I wind up in postmodernity and you know what I discover? If I'm sitting here with Sam with Scott, not Sam Adams. <laughs> well, I'm sitting here with Scott Adams. He says, "Do what you want to be happy." I'll say, "You know what? I'm not just going to watch movies. I'm going to live in the mother of all genres. I'm going to inhabit 
the LARPing that's been going on since, you know, Jesus didn't show up to Pilate. Jesus didn't show up to Caesar. Jesus showed up to his disciples and said, Jesus showed up to the disciples and said, touch my hands. Put your hand in my side. And even Bart Ehrman says, well, at least they thought they saw something. And they LARPed their way all the way to martyrdom. And that's the dangerous thing about Jordan Peterson. And that's why Sam Harris rightly gets nervous. And that's why Rationality Rules can't stop making videos, kind of like me. Where maybe me and me and, and Stefan, maybe Brett is right. And we ought to have that conversation. I'm happy to have that conversation. It's not going to be a fight. Watch my conversation with... Uh, you know, we'll have a perfectly lovely conversation. I'm a nice guy, ask anybody, and a lot of people say I'm too nice. But when it comes to this, I've yet to see the postmodernists that can really compel me to give up my Jesus LARPing. And for that matter, my Jesus smuggling. Oh, I should be, what, gain status in your social hierarchy? Guess what? Um, I'm never going to have much status in your social hierarchy. You know, oh, Paul, you've got 13,000 subs on YouTube. That ain't nothing. Like Stories of Old has 300,000. Tom Brady wins the Super Bowl, marries a supermodel, has all kinds of money. Go ahead and read that Sports Illustrated. I could have, I'd have to dig it up out of my resources, but ask the question, is this all there is? No amount I can quote Augustine nothing can satisfy who would not be satisfied with God we finally want everything don't we and Jesus he who would gain the whole world but lose his soul self psyche no, I, I'll, I'll, I'll LARP into the grave, boys and girls. That's, that's my plan. Because in many ways, the best story wins. And you can believe what you want, but that's sort of where postmodernity lies. The best story wins. Jordan Peterson said that, you know, we've been shaped by time and evolution to, to, to watch this little internal meaning compass. And it, it keeps pointing us towards these stories. And then I sort of apply the ontological argument and say, you know, I think the universe would be better if Jesus did rise from the dead. And I think the universe would be better if the kind of conversation like I had this morning in, in the Discord chat room, if I had more time to talk with, with Job and Luke and Jeff and Cassidy and Shelley and, and, and all of the wonderful people that that I've been talking to, and if I had more time to talk with randos, and if I had more time to talk with each individual rando, and if, if in fact this competition that creates hierarchy and status were leveled off by eternity, well, I can talk to Augustine or, you know, Peter Kreeft says, well, maybe Socrates too. I can talk to them for a good long time. I don't buy the ending of The Good Place. I think that's the ending if you've only got the kinds of creatures and sub-creators to work with that can create the kinds of things we create. At some point, the movie goes off, the TV show ends, and like at the end of the Truman Show, we're looking around for the remote. What else is on? Pay no attention to the builder billion dollar franchises, those who say that story versus reality. I swear we won't ruin them as we deconstruct them, Mr. Disney. Anyway, watch the two videos. They map beautifully the history of Western civilization. And if you understand the meaning crisis, it's not hard to see why we're at where we're at. And it's not hard to see why Jordan pushed so many over the edge. And here this young man on Uber Boyos is telling his story there. So that's how I see it.